the question has to do with pros and cons of the toll road system. Why isn't it being used in Iowa? And we, we, we get that question a fair amount. And we, we, when we did the study in 2006, uh, we looked at tolling as an option along with a whole other uh, host of options. Um, tolling may be feasible in Iowa in a few instances. The, the, the primary um, con is to, to put in tolling would be a tremendous capital cost to put in the toll facilities and, and build that infrastructure. And where, where that becomes a little less feasible is the volumes on the roads. You need to have a high volume of traffic to offset the high administrative costs that also come along with tolling. And then in Iowa, we also have, uh, with our 114,000 miles of roads and uh, a road every mile, uh, we have a lot of parallel infrastructure. So if we do tolling, we feel we might just move the traffic onto other roads and just move the problem around a little bit. Um, with all that being said, there, there may be some spots where it can be done. Um, you know, maybe some bridge. We have some really high bridge needs coming up. So we, we've had some border bridge tolls, not on, not told through Iowa side, but the border side. Um, and then maybe as technology advances, uh, you know, if we get to a mileage-based fee and can start uh, looking at traffic without having to, to build the infrastructure to collect tolls, then maybe it becomes a little more feasible. But generally, the consensus is that, that right now, today, it's not a real feasible option. John, John, I well, maybe just a word or two. The traditional con has been the uh, high cost of collection, but I think the technology has overcome that. Uh, the, the more important con, I think, is uh, making it visible that there's a cost to using the highways, and politically, uh, that's, uh, I think, a little bit more difficult. Um, the pros, uh, well, uh, frankly, the fact that you can uh, set tools uh, that take into account all kinds of circumstances uh, make the pros, in my mind, uh, a bit stronger than the cons. I was, oh. since, since tolling is, is actually a very, very hot topic in, in, in the U.S. right now, uh, I'll have my comments about tolling. One, uh, in my area that, that I do a lot of research on is, is public acceptance, and tolling is not accepted very widely. It's right next to increasing the fuel tax as a favorite thing to do. It's not. Um, so there's, there's a lack of public acceptance on tolling, except if you used the example of, of Chicago. You use the electronic tolling system, right? right. You, you use the transponder? Right, yeah. Right. Okay. One of the big issues when that was first introduced was people said they didn't want to use that. One big brother issue, government was going to be able to track me and identify where I'm driving. But what sold it was there's actually a tangible benefit that people saw because once they started using the electronic tolling system, they no longer had to sit in the congestion waiting to pay the toll. So they saw a direct benefit. So in those situations, tolling is a little bit easier to you know, get, get around. I'm sorry to if you had mentioned this already, but um, there's a prohibition on tolling federal, the interstates now, if there wasn't a toll on it, you can't put new tolls uh, for the most part unless it's a bridge. Is there anything we can do to reduce construction costs? Well, I, I guess one, one point I'd make is um, I spend a lot of time talking about hyperinflation of construction costs, and that actually isn't what we're experiencing now. Um, and at least in the last couple years, we've, uh, well, maybe not, I wouldn't go back a couple years, but at least in recent time, we've actually been very getting um, uh, some better results in construction costs for all components except uh, asphalt have actually dropped in the last year, uh, at least in Iowa. Um, and a lot of that is due not so much because materials prices have dropped, but because there's so much demand uh, for work. Uh, the contractors out there are hungry for business, so they're, the, the bids are very competitive. Um, so, so uh, you know, that, that's just kind of an economic factor. Uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't know that there's much to influence construction costs beyond that. Stu, is there an estimated cost per mile for roads in Iowa? Ooh, um, well, uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
Well, you know, I, I hesitate to even throw out a number, and maybe maybe Paul has has one off the top of the head. But yeah, it just varies so much on whether you're just doing a resurfacing or adding lanes or building on new right away. Um, but um, pretty high. You know, and part of it too is uh, as time progresses, we we think we get smarter in how we build roads and try to make them last longer and better geometric so they're safer. So we you know, we. We're, we're building roads a little wider, a little wider right away, so we have more clear zone for vehicles to recover. We want to do more paved shoulders so that vehicles can recover when they uh, go off the pavement. And um, so, so part of the cost increases too are just changes we're making to try to make the road safer. I think actually, if you look at life cycle cost, there have been some declines. Uh, if you if you look at uh, total cost of construction and divide that into the capital cost of the equipment and the labor cost and the materials cost. Uh, one of the problems has been material costs that have been going up because of worldwide demand, uh, structural steel, for example, and the like. But uh, there have been improvements in terms of the productivity of the labor and of the uh, capital equipment. And so I think if you look over the life cycle of a highway facility, uh, you'll actually find that some of those costs have been coming down. Um, as, as you point out, the quality has uh, been going up too. There's something else, and that is that there have been a, a number of studies uh, made and actual introduction of better pavement methods and better pavement materials and maintenance materials and um, winter um, uh, maintenance materials and everything else. So the, the whole thing is a moving target, and I think there are real improvements taking place as far as cost goes. Yeah, my response might play better for uh, civils um, in the audience, but there, there are tests and, and experiments looking at improving the materials that we use. Um, one of our researchers at the Pol Policy Center um, investigates something called a warm mix asphalt. Now, what that means is simply you don't have to heat the asphalt to a high temperature, like a standard asphalt that you do, which reduces the amount of energy that you need to pave, um, which can translate to a, a lower um, cost. It also has the side benefit of having less VOCs being emitted from the paving operation. There's some technical inferences to it. Would you agree that a fuel tax is regressive and how does that affect policy? I get to go on this one? Mm -hmm. All right. If you want. Yes. Is, is a fuel tax regressive? Yes. Not as aggressive, regressive as other forms of taxes, specifically the uh, sales tax. And so when you're looking at <coughs> using, a, using fuel, the fuel tax as a basis for tying the level of use to how much you pay, and that's pretty much the, right now the best thing that we have on, on that, for that option. Well, I, I do agree. It is a regressive uh, form of, uh, of raising revenue. Um, it is, uh, as Paul says, less regressive than most other mechanisms that you could use. And uh, just as uh, you might say that having a price on food is regressive because everybody needs a little bit of it anyway, and, and uh, uh, those who are wealthy can afford a lot more. It's uh, very similar with regard to automobiles and, and utilization of fuel. I don't know that you can get around that regressiveness unless you also uh, provide transfers of one sort or another. We do that a bit through transit. Uh, transit is used by uh, lots of different income levels of people, uh, but uh, we do support it in part through the uh, money paid uh, in, in the gas tax. I, I think that um, one of the one of the questions that always comes up is if you're going to re if you're going to increase the price of transportation and uh, make it a market clearing price, uh, and you're going to use something like um, a VMT tax or, or a uh, gas tax or something, um, what do you do about those who are essentially uh, taken off the roads, those who are told off, those, those who have uh, a burden. And I think that the answer to that is that you have to find uh, some means of uh, establishing first a means test and then uh, some way to uh, uh, supplement the incomes of those persons. The, the question has to do with the, the reduction in revenue is related to fewer miles, but the increase in tax, which will increase the overall cost of gas when people drive less, and will you net out of zero, basically? Well, the question has to do with uh, whether gasoline purchases are elastic or inelastic. And uh, essentially what, what you find is a great degree of uh, inelasticity in that as you raise those uh, gasoline uh, fees, 
um, you really don't uh, influence demand very much. You don't influence behavior very much. Why is it that you can have very high prices of fuel in European countries and yet have people utilizing fuel and utilizing automobiles? It's because of this great inelasticity. It's uh, higher in the short run, clearly. Uh, and can be lower in the long run as people make new choices about employment locations and residential locations and what they do with their time. Uh, but in the short run, I don't think it's uh, an issue. That's actually a, a concern that does come up on the federal level. If we're pursuing other policy goals, <coughs> clean air requires less emissions. You can do that by burning less fuel either increase the efficiency or you drive less. And yes, that does have the impact on reducing the amount of revenue coming in. Um, <clears throat> but as John said, it doesn't net out, you, know, you don't net out zero on it. Uh, so that's why part of the discussion on, on alternative finance is looking at either moving away from the fuel tax completely moving towards a mileage-based tax, but it, that still has the same issues that you, you just pointed out. So they're looking at also coupling that with tolling. So different types of, of tolling, whether it's congestion-based or um, just straight out, everybody, all users get tolled. You need a mix in the, in the revenue. And, and that's, that's also part of a, an ongoing discussion. Have we really hitched our wagon to just one source of funding and is, is that is, that, is it time to break that, that connection? The one comment I'd make is um, during my comments, I had mentioned that when we saw $4 gas, we did see transit ridership go uh, way up in, in the state of Iowa, um, which, which may not seem to, to match with the answers about it being pretty inelastic. But you have to keep in mind that transit ridership is is such a small percentage of the trips that when, when you do make, a, even though it's pretty inelastic, uh, you can make a big change in terms of percent differences in ridership and transit, and, and we certainly saw that. That figure you put up was what, 1% of the uh, uh, commute traffic by transit? Right. Yeah. The yep. question I do is why there was more discussion of walking, bicycling, other local transportation. Well, yeah. probably several reasons, and, and one would have to do with simply the statistics. Uh, bicycling has been a declining portion of the uh, trip-making behavior of Americans for quite some decades now. Uh, walking has uh, declined in some respects, but it has uh, held up a little bit more steady. But uh, nonetheless, uh, both of those are really rather minor parts of what goes on today. Now, what should go on, what you desire to go on, what might happen in the future is very different. But it's also tied to land use. And uh, one can advocate walking and bicycling. Uh, the state of Iowa has gone a long ways into producing bicycle trails. Uh, but uh, unless you uh, find that you have a comparable trip, and that's comparable in all kinds of respects uh, between people, uh, you aren't going to find people using those forms of transportation to any great extent. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I think that the, the uh, health benefits of walking and bicycling are elements of um, uh, positive externalities of those forms of transportation. But I don't think that the uh, typical user of transportation takes those kinds of externalities into, into account. And, uh, and the only reason I didn't mention biking and walking is uh, because of time, because I, I would, would have loved to have visited about that, because that, uh, in, the, in the division I um, am director of, we, we cover all modes of transportation and, and multimodal transportation. Uh, we take very seriously and, and advocate very strongly. And one of the um, efforts that uh, actually would be an emerging issue as well is, is doing a much better job of of linking land use and transportation and sustainable development and that this is a th emerging issue at the federal level. It's a big theme of this administration is livability and sustainability and we're likely to see that in funding programs that uh, uh, come through in the future at the federal level. But uh, in many things, transportation related, Iowa City is a model and, and I'd say they're a model in this area as well and it's something we're trying to build upon actually with our passenger rail efforts. Uh, if we're successful in securing funding for passenger rail service to Iowa City, um, the, the, the station would likely be in downtown Iowa City at the old depot. And uh, Iowa City, through the, the rebuilding efforts, uh, as you probably know, secured a grant from Environmental Protection Administration to look at 
um, smart growth uh, and passenger service as part of that, but all linking into proper land use decisions uh, to build upon biking and walking as a viable form of transportation, and we hope to build passenger rail on that as well. But, but now we, you know, complete streets is something we're working very hard on, and there's been some complete streets legislation proposed this session that would require every jurisdiction in the state to look at uh, developing a complete streets policy. So when we're out making highway improvements, we're considering um, making sure the sidewalks are built, bike lanes, uh, facilities that accommodate transit vehicles better than they do now. Uh, so I, I think that's a key part of transportation planning and programming in the future. Yeah, let me just pick up on, on Stu's point about at the federal level, the discussion now is, is moving towards livability, um, looking at applying smart growth principles within the transportation uh, area. Now, John and, and Stu might be able to talk uh, more than, than I can about the current situation with the reauthorization bill. The reauthorization bill for transportation comes up every five, supposed to be every four years. Six. Six. six sorry, every six years. Um, as Stu said, we're, we're a year, going to be a year out in December, um, probably before Congress picks up that, that challenge. But, you know, right now what I hear, um, especially from some of the, the groups within Washington, is that there is an effort to start looking at the funding mechanism, so it's perhaps not that 84, 16% split, but there's more moving away from roads. Now that starts, uh, you know, the equity issues that, that come up. And there's people who are going to say, if you move any more money out of the road system, you're going to cripple the nation. So, so that debate hasn't actually come to the surface yet, but it will. One, one quick comment uh, in addition. I, I teach a course in sustainable transportation, and I was pretty excited last uh, year when a new National Academy of Science uh, report came out, uh, essentially asking, uh, is it possible, what would it take to move to more bicycling, more transit, uh, more, more walkable uh, areas? And um, my class and I went through that report kind of carefully, and uh, it seemed to be well put together. And it unfortunately had conclusions uh, that suggested it is uh, very long term to bring about change. The prospects of much change in the next decade or two decades, uh, even given major and dra drastic uh, policy um, direction, uh, is to make a several percent change, perhaps. That's, that's discouraging, and, and it suggests a really long range nature of land use and transportation and how they tie together and how if you are going to produce a change in directions, you darn well better start and you, you are going to be in for a long haul. Did, did the increase in transit and gas prices were high help to make transit costs more self-sufficient? Uh, the answer is unfortunately no. Uh, the additional riders, uh, among other things, resulted in some additional services and additional cost. And the figure, remember, I, I think Paul was mentioning this, that the user is paying about 30% of the operating, not total, operating cost of transit uh, means that, um, you know, you add more riders and you end up adding more costs. Now, that's taking no, no account of externalities or anything else, but just in terms of a pocketbook of a transit operating system. And bus systems, I must say, are ones where it's more 15 to 20 percent in terms of the fare box recovery ratio. The large recovery ratios are from places like the New York subway system, which approximates 100 percent of, uh, of operating cost. Now, could you explain why an additional person, why the, there's an additional marginal cost if you put one person onto a bus that has space? <coughs> Well, to begin with, the fares are very low, so the additional revenue that you get is, is not very much. If there is indeed space and all you're doing is occupying an empty seat, then that additional revenue is only in a minor way offset by any additional cost of fuel or anything else for the, the bus. But the, the problem is that uh, you get additional demands on the system, and that means that you are in need of supplying additional services, more people. Um, plus, the, the other aspect is that we do still have a, a peaking problem with our transit systems. And so if you add more people and they are commuters and they want to ride at the uh, choice time of 7.30 in the morning and so forth, you aren't going to have those seats and you have to provide more vehicles. 
Just, hey, a couple weeks ago, I, I was talking with the manager of Ames System, Cyrod. And she, she had mentioned that the fourth quarter last year, they saw an 8% increase in ridership. And she was a little bit concerned, thinking with the reduction in gas prices that they would lose those riders. But two weeks ago, she came back and she said, you want to know something? For the fourth quarter of this year, this past year, they saw an increase of 13% over that original 8%. So not only did they catch, keep the riderships that they, they gained, but they added more to it. So I had asked her, well, why do you think, what caused that? Because gas prices are down. Um, she's kind of scratching her head because we don't really have an answer for that. And she just guessed maybe it has something to do with the weather, that we had more snow on the ground, harder to park. Um, people use the transit system. But it's not a, a substantial enough increase to make it a, a matching their cost, recovering their cost. By the way, pointing out how, how all of these policies fit together, the point uh, Paul was just making about parking, I think, is a very strong one. And I know that uh, all of you are aware of uh, parking prices. And indeed, uh, people in Iowa City often say that their biggest transportation problem is finding a place to park. But if you uh, pay a little bit more attention to pricing parking and doing so in uh, essentially smarter ways, I think you can have a nice impact on increasing transit ridership. What states have the best transportation systems? Well, that, that's that's a, a good question. Actually, there's a, there's a report that's done every year. It's the the one report I've seen where uh, at least they try to rank states based on their performance, and it's actually done by the Reason Foundation now, um, and uh, and that, that's frankly a pretty widely criticized report, at least from the DOTs that get ranked by uh, by that report. Um, primarily because it's it's just hard to compare states uh, states are so different both in the different climates they face and how the systems are operated for example in Iowa I talked about the state owning the system about uh, oh nine percent of the system some states own a lot more of the system Missouri for example they own about I think though basically the whole paved road system in Missouri um, so uh, you know and you can look at conditions of, of infrastructure. Um, so I, I, I think, at least from my perspective, the answer is there's not really a good mechanism out there to compare the states. Uh, but obviously, we do work uh, very closely. We have a very strong national organization uh, of state DOTs that uh, uh, supports a lot of research through uh, different organizations and to uh, try to improve what we're doing all across the board but uh, and learn from what we're doing uh, uh, what other states are doing best practices but but I, I don't think there's a good tool out there to, to compare you're, you're quite right that there have been those studies and attempts to try and compare between the states um, and it's a, extremely difficult I think that why Iowa maybe is not doing that well but I wouldn't say that it's not doing reasonably well especially with its uh, resources is a, 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 a a creature of geography. We're a rural state. We've got lots of rural roads. And uh, those on a per capita basis, on a per VMT basis, a per anything basis, are darn expensive to keep going. And when you change from an agricultural state uh, where there are a fair number of people in rural areas utilizing farm to market roads to what we have today and are moving towards, which is a few uh, agglomerations of people and scattered areas with hardly anyone it's uh, extremely expensive to maintain that kind of a rural road system. Could you speak to a little bit about the distribution of funds to rural versus urban areas in Iowa? Ooh, well, I, I, I alluded a little bit to the, the controversy between distribution of funding and um, actually that, that, that is a very contentious issue when you're talking about uh, distribution of funding between rural versus urban areas. and. Um, you know, I, I think we feel that success is when no one's happy with, with the distribution, and, and I, that's certainly the case with, with what we have today. Um, historically, I, I think um, the, the, the formula for distributing road use tax funds in Iowa has been changed a few times over time, and, and those changes have been 
less to counties and more to cities and the DOT. So that, that's been the trend over time. Uh, when we were dealing with our last road use tax fund study when we created Time 21, we decided we didn't want to get into that core formula fight, um, primarily because cities, counties, and the state have needs far in excess of revenues, so we, we shouldn't really be talking about how to, to divvy up that base money, but what we did do is change how the new money is distributed. And there, again, the counties uh, are getting less than what they get of the, the, the core funding, I'll call it, the road use tax funding. Um, so it's an ongoing fight. You know, the counties would, would say they have 90,000 miles of roads, 20,000 of the 25,000 bridges. Uh, it's very aging. They have the great, greatest share of structurally deficient bridges. Um, so, so they need, need more money. Cities would say, well, yeah, but we have most of the traffic in the state. All the growth is happening in the cities. Uh, people are moving from rural to urban Iowa, so we need, need a greater share. Uh, both sides are probably right. Uh, well, you know, what we try to say is we need to grow the, grow the pie uh, and fight less about the distribution, but that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge. Well, to finish up here, since this is a policy class, um, I'm going to ask each of you if you could change one policy related to transportation that you think would have the biggest impact, what would that policy change be? <laughs> no, I don't really. <laughs> Uh, I suppose that uh, one overall policy change would be to um, have a wiser use of subsidies. Transportation is full of a variety of different kinds of subsidies, and we've, we've just touched on, on a few of them here. And I think that so many of them, uh, just the way that uh, uh, distributions of uh, revenues between rural areas and urban areas and so forth, uh, have been around for a long time, and they may no longer have a need uh, to, to, to operate, but they do have uh, interest groups, they do have supporters, and so it's very hard to move from uh, traditional types of subsidies in transportation to, uh, to, as I say, somewhat wiser use of subsidies to try and achieve uh, desired overall goals. So if one were to change the subsidy mechanisms, I think that would be a major policy change. That having been said, I think it is very, very hard to do. Um, well, the, the, I'm sure I could do a more eloquent answer with a little more time to, to contemplate this, and this is probably as borderline policy, but I, you know, I think one of the issues that we struggle with is what's happening with transportation funding at the federal level. Uh, each authorization bill, uh, we see the creation of many new funding programs uh, that have questionable federal role, uh, at least in some people's minds, and I think this probably gets a little bit into John's subsidization comments, um, and, um, and probably a little too much political influence at the federal level and how those funds are distributed. Uh, you know, earmarks used to be a challenge um, in, in programming funding in, in, in a comprehensive manner. Uh, what we're seeing a little bit here in, in recent time is, is earmarking, but earmarking a little bit more at the executive level with discretionary programs where states apply for funding and are awarded funding um, instead of um, where we'd like to see is, is the way federal funding used to happen more where it's focused into just a couple core programs distributed by formula to states um, and then leave it to the states to decide how to best distribute that money. And that's, you know, sev several of the national commissions that have been met or meeting to talk about the next authorization have been trying to, to get there, but yet also providing states some flexibility for them to decide uh, how that funding should be distributed amongst different programs. I'm going to take your question and turn it on its head. Uh, I'm not going to suggest a change in policy. Uh, rather, I'm going to go to where most seems that at least the transportation conversations that I have, I have always tend to end up, and that is the money side on the revenue side. So what, what I would be advocating for is not moving away from a user pay principle on how we fund our transportation systems. Keep the subsidies, improve the subsidies to, to balance some, or address some of the equity issues with that, 
Um, but really seriously look at the implications of moving away from a user pay um, policy. So that's what I would say.